What you are about to see is a very important interview about the most important issue of our time. America is at a seminal moment in its history. We've been at these moments before, 40 years ago, when our country's Supreme Court was deciding on the legalization of abortion. We know that the decision of Roe versus Wade, so infamous, against the will of the people, against morality and God's law, has had tremendous consequences for our country, exponentially increasing the number of abortions and altering the very landscape with regards to the sanctity of life and the value of the human person. We're at a similar moment today with the subject of so-called same-sex marriage. The redefinition of marriage, should it be legalized by the Supreme Court, will have tremendous ramifications on our lifestyle in America. In this interview, which I'm asking you to sit down and watch, I'll be interviewing one of the most articulate promoters of marriage and one of its great champions, Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione, the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church in San Francisco. Please, for your own education, sit down and open your ears and your hearts and become educated on this very important subject so that you can do what is your own responsibility before God and your fellow Americans. Thank you very much for your attention and God bless you. On behalf of Patristic Nectar Publications, the Arena Podcast, and Ancient Faith Radio, I would like to begin by saying it's a tremendous honor to interview today His Excellency Salvatore Cordiglione, Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of San Francisco. Your Excellency, thank you for entertaining this interview. You're welcome. My pleasure. Am I right in thinking that this Archdiocese is virtually as old as the state of California? Yes, that's right. It's just a couple of years younger than the state of California. I first met His Excellency some 10 years ago at a theological conference in San Diego, at which time he was the auxiliary bishop in San Diego. And I was pleased again to see Your Excellency in Washington, D.C. in March at the March for Marriage, uh, at which you addressed the gathering. The Archbishop is a native Californian, having been born and raised in San Diego. I think he turned 57 just this last Wednesday. Yesterday, yes. Yesterday. <laughs> Happy belated birthday. Thank you. He's a graduate of the University of San Diego, where he studied philosophy. He completed his doctorate in canon law at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome in 1989. He was ordained a priest and began pastoring in 1982 and served for seven years at the Supreme Tribunal in Rome, the Catholic Church's highest canonical court. In 2002, he was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of the Diocese of San Diego. In 2009, he was appointed the Bishop of Oakland, and in 2012 was installed as Archbishop of San Francisco, in which see he continues today. Archbishop Salvatore is well known throughout America for his advocacy and untiring efforts in the nourishment and defense of marriage. He chairs the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Subcommittee for the Defense of Marriage and was instrumental in the promotion and passage of California's Proposition 8. And as our nation anticipates later this month, the Supreme Court decisions concerning Prop 8 and the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, we are exceedingly happy to be able to interview today one of marriage's champions in America, Your Excellency. Thank you. Your Excellency, would you address first for our listeners the historical genesis behind the demand for the legalization of same-sex marriage? How did this push for so-called same-sex marriage actually arise? Those of us who are my age and older will recall what the 60s were like. Mm. That time of revolution, so a lot of social revolution and the so-called uh, sexual revolution when the sexual mores were all lifted and 
uh, it was all a part of that sort of social movement. It's well known what happened in, in New York in 1969, the so-called Stonewall Riots, when that, um, that so-called gay nightclub was raided by the police. And uh, the people there reacted against being treated that way. And it began, it's well known that a movement started from that point. They traced the origin of it to that point. I think a lot of people were uh, sympathetic, uh, people of goodwill, that um, because people have a certain sexual orientation, shouldn't be persecuted and harmed. And uh, so uh, the, the movement gained a lot of sympathy, I think, from, from people from different perspectives. But the movement began to grow, uh, especially beginning in the 80s, uh, to, uh, to uh, to sort of uh, garner acceptance of a certain kind of a lifestyle, um, which fit in, again, it, fit, it fits in well with what was going on with social movements in general and the whole area sexual mores because uh, it was a, an age, we're living in an age of a lot of promiscuity. And uh, so uh, I think understandably there's, uh, there was a movement to try to gain acceptance of people who are attracted to the same sex being able to be accepted as well if everyone else is being accepted and living this way. A book was published in the 1980s called uh, After the Ball, which uh, explained a three-stage strategy for um, uh, obtaining the objective. Uh, which was to desensitize people, uh, to jam, which is to shut down opposition to the movement, and then to convert people to the cause. And we began to see then in the 80s and in the 90s uh, a growing movement of you know, gay pride events, um, things being taught in the schools and things like that. Then uh, when these laws are being passed, as I had mentioned, people a lot of people of goodwill were sympathetic that people attracted to the same sex should, shouldn't be harmed. Uh, when local ordinances were being passed uh, about against these kind of hate crimes and hate speech, um, some people I think were, as I recall, this is maybe a bit anecdotal, but as I recall, some people were comfortable with that but were told that um, it wasn't about trying to promote an agenda, it was about protecting people from harm who've been, who been persecuted over history, and that's where I think uh, people were able to accept that. Hmm. But then we began to see how there was a growing movement of these, especially what was being taught in the schools, what was being portrayed in the media, and so forth. Then there was a movement for uh, civil unions, and people objected to that, and they were told that, uh, well, this isn't about going after marriage. It's about giving the same rights and benefits of marriage to same-sex couples. Mm -hmm so they can enjoy those benefits, but people who believe marriage can only be between a man and a woman can have their right respected as well, so it's a compromise everyone could live with. Well, as soon as civil rights, uh, civil union legislations became ensconced in a lot of states, we saw the movement to get it accepted as marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when people, when there was a movement for a federal marriage amendment, it was said by those favoring the legalization of same-sex marriage that we didn't need a federal marriage amendment because marriage laws are determined by the state, so we don't need something at the federal level. When California passed uh, Proposition 8 and uh, the people who were opposed to Proposition 8 challenged it in the court, they exhausted their recourses in the state court system. What did they do? They introduced it into the federal law system after having said that we didn't need uh, a federal marriage amendment. So there has been a well-orchestrated orchestra strategy over these decades. Mm -hmm. um, but it's because it's been accepted by so many people because uh, our understanding of marriage has been so weakened over these decades. In our Catholic tradition, we refer to the three goods of marriage that come from St. Augustine, which are really the idea is encapsulated in, in all cultures, really 
the three goods of marriage, as St. Augustine teaches, of permanence, fidelity, and openness to offspring. And if we can reflect on what's been happening in these last 50 years since these social and sexual revolutions, uh, we saw uh, couples, uh, we saw, well, widespread promiscuity and cohabitation, uh, this so-called pra so practice of so-called swinging, mm -hmm. you know, so we see the good of fidelity being undermined, that it's not necessarily exclusive to marriage. Uh, couples uh, marrying without any intention to have children, and then the real death blow, no-fault divorce, mm -hmm. which uh, completely undermined the idea of marriage as a permanent commitment. Uh, so we see th these three identifying marks of marriage that set marriage apart from any other kind of relationship have already been uh, chipped away at and almost completely destroyed. So people already were not seeing marriage as the conjugal union of a man and a woman for life of exclusive and mutual fidelity for the procreation and education of offspring, the classic view of marriage. They already were seeing marriage as a relationship for the mutual benefit of adults to which the state gives sanction and certain mm -hmm. benefits. So it's not surprising that the idea that any two people, regardless of their sex, should have the opportunity uh, to have these benefits. Uh, we might ask, well then what will the next step be? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we don't need a man and a woman, why limit it to two? There already is, are, there are some people calling for polyamorous uh, marital relationships. Your Excellency, I, I've read a few, I'm, I've been no way, by no means a scholar in this area, but I've read a few histories, uh, gay histories, uh, of the movement itself by gay and, and lesbian authors. And I find it highly ironic that um, that the cause of same-sex marriage would, would take in that community since uh, historically, objectively, marriage has always been viewed as um, a patriarchal imposition <laughs> uh, and something that was mocked in the movement. How, how did it go from, or, or would you say I'm correct in thinking that marriage became popular as a rallying cry for the movement as a means to legitimize itself through the courts. Is that a, a, a reasonable understanding for why marriage would be popular amongst them as an issue? That, that's a very good question. That's a very good point, you know, because I recall that marriage being, especially with the rise of feminism, seen marriage as patriarchal and, and outmoded. And still today, I've, I've surfed yes. many websites and they're still banging marriage as you know, a religious, patriarchal imposition that should be thrown off by those who want freedom. The real goal isn't marriage. Uh, when they, when uh, people have s with same-sex attraction have the right to marry someone of the same sex, very few of them actually do. And if it were about just getting rights and benefits, uh, they already have that in a lot of states with domestic partnerships or civil unions. So it's not really about marriage. It's, in fact, the goal really is to destroy marriage in order to uh, have a social affirmation of a certain lifestyle and orientation. This is not, I'm not making this up, it's stated explicitly in, in the Prop 8 decision, uh, uh, the district court judge, Von Walker, um, said it in his decision that it, it's about giving uh, societal affirmation. Mm -hmm. They need the affirmation of marriage, just like everyone else. Uh, Ted Olson arguing um, for the um, plaintiffs challenging the Prop 8 law in his closing arguments at the Ninth Circuit said that uh, the gay couples need the societal affirmation of marriage because their children would be uh, harmed when they see their classmates in school having parents who are married and their gay parents are not. Just as a bracket, I wonder where he was 40 years ago mm. when people were having children outside of marriage. <laughs> this sounds, seems like too little too late yes. in my mind. But uh, besides that, he said the point is to give them societal affirmation. Mm -hmm. So it's this the, proponents, the proponents of this type of uh, the legalization of these kind of unions state quite explicitly it's about societal affirmation. Mm -hmm. So until we say you are normal, you are normal, you are just like us, the uh, conflict won't end. There's, I, th I think the conflict is very deep and it 
I even if that were to happen, it still wouldn't end uh -huh. because there's a, a much deeper conflict going on in terms of what's going on in the soul, what's going on in the psyche. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency chairs the subcommittee for the promotion and defense of marriage for the Catholic Conference of Bishops in this land. You're a leading figure in the defense of traditional marriage and you speak and publish articulately in many venues. Why is it so important to you to resist the legalization of same-sex marriage? What's important to me is rebuilding the marriage culture. Uh, I spoke about how marriage has already been dismantled, has been going on for a long time. This is just the next step in the dismantling of a marriage culture. My fear is that with this, we would com lose the definition of marriage altogether in its most basic form as the faithful, fruitful union of a man and a woman. Faithful is weakened, but people still think there's something special about yes. being faithful to marriage as promiscuous as our society is. People still think it's a good thing when children come from marriage. But if we remove the idea you need a man and a woman, then to reclaim a marriage culture is going to be a, 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 a huge challenge. Uh, people will not have the basic idea of what marriage is. So it's not, it's not passing judgment on how people live their personal lives or work out their intimate relationships. It's keeping enshrined in the law this idea that society needs an institution that connects children to their mothers and their fathers. Yes. This is in the bed. Not, it's not always possible for all children, but society should be doing everything possible to enable children to be raised by their mother and, and their father. You said publicly last month that the meaning of marriage cannot be redefined because its essential meaning resides in our nature. Would you explain what that means? What does that mean? Marriage is a natural reality, the, the conjugal union of a man and a woman. It's the only way in nature that children are, are created. Uh, that is what marriage is about, the uh, conjugal comprehensive union of um, the one flesh union of the man and a woman. So if we look at the act, the, it's a one flesh union by which children are procreated. We have there the two ends of marriage for the procreation and education of the children and the, the union of the man and the woman and their, their mutual good. That exists in nature. And so what society does is recognize that, mm -hmm. sees the importance of that, and it's good for the community, for those children to be raised by the man and the woman who brought them into the world. And it enshrines this in the law and gives it support. But it's something that exists, and it's not just for us to redefine as we think best for the mutual benefit of adults. It, it's impossible. Two men and two women cannot have a conjugal union. It is physically, biologically impossible. Mm -hmm. And if that's not what marriage is about, then the question is, well, why should society be interested anyway? Why should government give it any recognition? What's the public good? It's just giving uh, some recognition of benefits to friends who happen to be sexually involved with each other. Mm -hmm. But it's not a conjugal union. It can't be. Should the Supreme Court declare same-sex marriage to be constitutional later this month, what negative impact, Your Excellency, will the broad acceptance of same-sex marriage have on our society? How, how, practically speaking, will the marriage culture be damaged <coughs> by a decision like that by the Supreme Court? The law is a teacher. Um, when people see this uh, mm -hmm. legalization, they'll begin to believe that this can be a marriage and marriage ultimately will be redefined out of existence. That will be to the detriment of more and more children will be growing up without their mothers and their fathers. Uh, now it's not to say that in some cases they can grow up happy and healthy and contributing citizens. Um, when I'm interviewed I, I repeat over and over, I know there's uh, single parent households and even same sex parent households where they're making lots of sacrifices trying to raise their children responsibly, give them a good home, a good education, teach them responsibility, and so forth. But you cannot deny that growing up without a mother or a father is a deprivation. 
uh, so it's not a judgment on parenting skills, but uh, mothers and fathers are just simply irreplaceable. We're going to have more and more children growing up without mothers and fathers. And that's good. That's going to be harmful to our society. Yes. Uh, I've also said often in, in interviews such as this, when I was the Bishop of Oakland, I lived on one side of Lake Merritt. On the other side of Lake, it was a very nice downtown neighborhood in the immediate blocks around there. On the other side of Lake Merritt began First Avenue, went all the way up to 100 Avenue, 100 blocks of East Oakland, it's all inner city. Um, so it's plagued by what inner city neighborhoods are plagued by, of youth violence, um, drugs, crime, and so forth. It's obvious that that's because of fatherlessness. We've yes. been plagued by this problem of fatherlessness for decades. We should understand the harm of children growing up without a father or, or with an abusive father. The solution to the problem isn't to give children two fathers <laughs> yes. or two mothers and no father. <laughs> I was very happy and delighted to read Cardinal Dolan's letter to President Obama uh, commending him for his uh, public proclamations honoring Mother's Day and Father's Day, yes. but noticing, noting also that uh, that was inconsistent with his promotion of same-sex marriage. I think it's a fantastic point. Yes. I'm, wondering, I'm wondering, Your Excellency, if there's quite a bit more uh, that will follow the legalization of same-sex marriage, should that happen uh, this month. I'm especially thinking about those places in the world, in the West, in the secular West, where uh, same-sex <coughs> marriage has already become normative. I was reading a study recently about the effects uh, on terms for participation in public life in Canada, where same-sex marriage was legalized about 10 years ago. And the author made the point that, um, in fact, the whole nature of public discourse for Christians, for traditional believers, actually not just Christians, but for Jews and traditional Muslims as well, well has changed. The, the opportunity for freedom of expression, uh, the rights of conscience, parental rights in the education of their children. Uh, this author suggested that all of those areas were deeply affected by the legalization of same-sex marriage. Would you anticipate similar consequences in our own country? Not anticipate, it's already happening. Mm. Uh, people have to understand that if this is legalized, then the law is acknowledging what people who hold to the traditional view of, the mar of marriage are being accused of by those who oppose them, that they're bigots that they're motivated by hatred. So if they want to know what it's going to be like for people in the future who think that marriage can only be between a man and a woman, all we have to do is think about how people nowadays who are racial bigots, how they're treated and how they're regarded. Mm. And it's not against the law to be a bigot, but there are certain rights and privileges that uh, would not, uh, privileges especially, that won't be granted, you know. You can't re get, uh, for example, a, a broadcasting license to a broadcast, uh, to have a station that is run ro along racial lines, saying mm -hmm. that people of a certain race are inferior and should be marginalized or harmed. Sure. You, you can't be given a license to open a school along racist lines. Uh, marriage therapists will not, wouldn't be given a license if they exclude giving therapy to couples of a certain race. The same thing not only is going to happen, already is happening. There are lots and lots of examples of how this is affecting people. You mentioned parental rights. Uh, there's uh, the case of the couple in, in Massachusetts when they learned that their son in his kindergarten class was going to be taught about homosexual relationships and, and marriage. Wanted their son pulled out of class during that lesson, and they were told they had no right to have him pulled out because mm -hmm. this was part of the curriculum. Mm. When the father appeared at the school to insist that his son be pulled out, instead of having his parental rights respected, he was handcuffed, arrested, and taken off to jail. <laughs> so you got the state getting involved in this most intimate, sacred relationship between parents and children because of this issue. There's the example of the uh, gynecologist in San Diego County who. Uh, re refused to artificially inseminate uh, a lesbian so she and her partner could raise a child because of a religious belief she wouldn't do that for any couple that wasn't married yes. and told the woman that she could return on another day and another doctor would do that for her. Not good enough. She was um, sued and she lost her case. There's a, the example of the wedding photographer in New Mexico uh, 
declined to photograph uh, a lesbian couple in their commitment ceremony. Likewise, sued and lost. So now, I guess people have a constitutional right to have their picture taken by the photographer of their choice. Mm. You know, there and there are lots. There are lots of other examples, and and it will only get worse. We have the example of the Catholic Charities agencies in the Archdiocese of Boston, the Archdiocese of Washington, sure. the state of Illinois. Uh, you know, even though there are plenty of other adoption agencies that will put children up in same-sex households, but because these agencies believe children should be raised by a mother and a father and would only put them in households with mothers and fathers, even though everyone else would put them up in other kinds of households, they were denied their license. Yes. Well, that might be shocking to us, but think about, do you think an adoption agency should be given a license if it would refuse to put up for adoption children of a certain race? Hmm. So it's people who hold the traditional view of marriage are going to be regarded by society and treated as such as how people who are racial bigots nowadays. So there's their parental rights, their religious liberty issues, uh, their freedom of conscience issues. And another thing that people haven't really thought through, um, but if you want to read more about it, I would suggest the book by What is Marriage by Professor, Rob, Professor Robbie George and two of his students, Shreve Girgis and uh, Ryan Anderson. They make the point that it will also undermine our understanding of friendship. Mm -hmm. because the, this, what they call the revisionist view of marriage as opposed to the conjugal view, the classical view. The revisionist view sees the only difference in marriage, it's not one of type, but it's of degree. It's the most intensive type of a friendship and of affection. And so people will begin to see that the only way to express friendship is in this way, and they won't see marriage as being a unique relationship and friendship having its own unique uh, relationship as well. And they'll not be able to understand the difference between marriage yes, and friendship. So we'll undermine also our capacity for friendship. Oof, oof. I'd like to follow down this path a little bit more. The rallying cry for the human rights campaign, this leading uh, proponent of uh, same-sex marriage in our nation, is marriage equality. And they're making the argument that you've been <coughs> referring to, that uh, this is a matter of civil rights, that uh, it is a civil right for people of the same sex to marry. What, you've said a little bit about this, but I'm asking if you, if you would expound a little bit more. What is the essential error in that argument, that it's a civil right for people of the same sex to marry? You can't have a right to something that's impossible. You know, I've gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of um, backlash from my uh, comparison, but I'll say it again. It's like legalizing male breastfeeding. It's, it's physically impossible, so how can you have a right to it? You could call it something else. You could call it uh, mutual adult uh, beneficiaries. You know, you could call it something else, but it can't be marriage because marriage exists the way it does in the culture. So they're using the classic strategy of manipulating the language. It's not about equality um, because it's something different from marriage. So it's, it's not expanding the right of marriage, it's changing the meaning of marriage yes, into indeed. something that it can't be. And how are how are same-sex attracted people harmed anyway mm -hmm. by not being able to marry someone of the same sex? They have, if it's a matter of right, again, if it's a matter of rights and benefits, they already had that with civil unions for one thing. And even sure. without that, there are other ways to uh, acquire those rights in the law in terms of the adult relationship. Sure. But as Your Excellency has mentioned, it's not really about that. No, it's, it's not. It's very much about social affirmation, and we have a major worldview clash between people of faith in our nation and people who are more secular without a commitment to moral absolutes that would guide and, more and, and form what they think about what should be socially approved. Yes, exactly. Your Excellency, as a, as a priest and a father confessor, it's been my experience, granted it's a limited experience, I've been a priest 20 years, and 
it's not that much. But it's been my experience <laughs> that the rise of the social acceptance of uh, homosexual behavior has had tremendous pastoral implications upon my flock. And uh, through my, my brotherhood with other priests throughout our country, I know it's their experience as well. Uh, in California, that's especially poignant since our legislature decided very recently to really get involved in promoting homosexuality in the schools, making May 22nd Harvey Milk Day. And uh, I had a six-year-old come home to his parents this year uh, <laughs> from, this is first grade, and uh, this child came home and said to his mother, uh, Mommy, you did not teach me right. And she said, what do you mean, sweetheart? She, he said, you taught me that marriage was between a man and a woman, and it's not. It can be between a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, or a man and a man. And this is uh, first grade. I'm wondering, is it your archpastoral judgment that uh, the rise of this movement is also having translating to tremendous pastoral consequences for the people in the pew? Is this really, is this something just to be debated by lawyers and priests who care so much about moral education? Or is this having tremendous moral influence uh, for bad upon the basic American person who would come to church? Oh, huge, huge. It's all, it's replete in the culture, and that's a affecting our people in the pew, certainly. Turn on the television, watch a movie, look at a TV commercial. Uh, it's not just the homosexual movement, it's all the whole concept of what the purpose of our human sexuality yes. is uh, in general. But uh, it's most especially uh, this issue now. Uh, I mean, wherever you turn, uh, we see this. So, yeah, of course they're being affected by Sexual it. Sexual experimentation and things that they wouldn't have normally even considered. Yes. They're, they're being really indoctrinated with. Yes. Mm. If I could end, uh, end this interview, Your Excellency, with uh, an appeal to you to speak directly to myself and to our listeners, uh, to the Orthodox Christians of America who have from a distance, uh, in most cases, admired your leadership, admired the labors, the real valiant efforts of the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to defend religious freedom in this country, to defend marriage, to defend unborn children. Um, the Assembly of Bishops in America, of Orthodox Bishops, last year uh, publicized a statement expressing solidarity with uh, their Catholic bishop brothers on these issues. And your speaking has been very educational for us. I'm wondering if you could speak directly to us. How can we assume our responsibility also as an Orthodox community? What can we contribute? How can we co-labor in this? One sort of side benefit I see to what's going on in the culture is God in his own way is bringing his people together. The ecumenical cooperation has been uh, very uh, heartening. and. Uh, I think we see where we need to stand together in terms of what's happening to our civilization. We all, as people of faith, whatever uh, Christian tradition we're coming from, and even non-Christians see that it's the question of our civilization that's at stake. As huge as that is, there's something even greater at stake and much deeper. And this is where I think the Orthodox can make a very needed contribution uh, to the effort especially for us Catholics. Think about what our faith is. Our faith is a covenant. Our religion is a religion of covenant. The whole Judeo-Christian religious tradition is one of covenant. God created, at the very beginning, he created them male and female to be fruitful and to multiply and to subdue the earth. He made a covenant with the people of Israel that covenant was a marriage covenant. And the prophets, when they were uh, excoriating the people for their infidelity to the covenant, compared them to uh, an adulterous wife. You know, it was a marriage covenant. Then God fulfills that covenant through the blood of his son, Christ the bridegroom and the church his bride. And he brings it to fulfillment at the end of the Bible, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Hmm. And this nuptial imagery is expressed in our Christian liturgy going back to the Jerusalem temple. Remember the Holy of Holies was veiled. That veil was sheltering what is sacred, the Holy of Holies. In Christian liturgy we use veils because the, what is sacred is veiled. 
the veil, then when Christ dies, the veil is torn because now the marriage is consummated. Mm. So um, the great Catholic orator, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, even refers to Christ's blood on the cross as a seminal fluid. Mm. Goodness. Christ gives uh, the seed of truth to the church. The church receives the seed of truth and as mother generates new life for God's kingdom through the grace of the sacraments, especially baptism, nurtures that life as a mother nurtures the life from her breast, nurtures that life by the teaching of the truth that Christ guarantees to his church. Christ is bridegroom, church is bride. This express, is expressed in the liturgy. So in cl classic Christian liturgy, and this is where the Orthodox have a, a huge contribution to make because the Orthodox liturgy in the different Eastern churches, it's replete with this, especially with this veiling, that the veil is removed or the great doors are open at the moment of communion because that is the consummation. Just as in a marriage, what is, what is most sacred about us? What is most sacred is what's most intimate. Mm. Uh, we, we wear clothes, but no matter how skimpy our clothes are, we keep the most intimate marts covered because that's what's sacred. But that has to be unveiled for a marriage to be consummated. Uh, this is what happens in the Christian liturgy. So the whole concept of our relationship to God and who God is to us and the covenant he made with us is resting on the imagery of marriage. Marriage is everything. We've lost that in the West to a large extent. Uh, it's become a little more academic. Uh, in the East, it's still experiential. You can, you can sort of instinctually know that from the liturgy, even if you don't, can't articulate it sure. academically. So the East, with its uh, more mystical, spiritual, experiential focus on how all this, the meaning of all of this is expressed in the, in the liturgy, which is the very heart of our religion, we need that influence in the West. Thank you. And on behalf of those who are listening to us and are benefiting, please keep going. God strengthen you in all your good deeds. Thank you. And God bless you. <laughs>